salvation, to find some kind of pact of fairness that each of them can recognize to be rational. Okay, and so the last point to make here, um, I alluded to a kind of ambiguity in Hobbes last time, and I want to mention that again here. Um, and that is, it's not entirely clear whether we should read this work as broadly ethical or more narrowly political. And maybe you can see a little bit more clearly why there's this ambiguity. Because when our focus is on justice, when our focus is on principles that can hopefully resolve and adjudicate conflicting views about the good life and do it rationally and fairly. In some ways, this problem of justice is going to span the gap between merely political and more broadly um, ethical. So it kind of clouds this distinction a little bit. Um, when we say, when I say that justice is concerned with the possibility of people with different values living together without murdering each other, that makes it sound quite political. The question is, how can people get along in society when they have these different ethical views, different views about value? And that's right. So there definitely is a political dimension here, which social and political and economic institutions allow people with these different values to get along. So that makes the question of justice sound political, and that's right. On the other hand, um, well, uh, on the other hand, let me be very clear that this problem of justice people getting along in the face of these dis disagreements, still is an evaluative question, still is a normative question. We're asking what, how should, should political and economic and social institutions be arranged? We're not merely describing what already exists. We're making an evaluation. We're saying, in light of these conflicting values that people hold, how should we design social institutions? How should we design political structures? Um, so there's definitely a kind of ethical dimension here. The difference is that this is not that this question is not spanning all of, of ethics. It's not spanning all of morality. It doesn't tell us what the good life consists of. Um, so in the terms that I put last time, um, this question is not, this question of justice, is not simply a matter of identifying the moral principle and then applying it to this particular case. Right? We need to work up standards of evaluation to solve this particular problem. It's not simply a matter of applied ethics, where we take the more abstract moral principle that we already know and then simply apply it. Okay, questions about any of that? All right, so I'm ready to start talking about the introduction to Leviathan in light of this background. Okay, so Hobbes starts the introduction here. Um, essentially with an assertion of materialism. He says that basically life, here he means especially human beings, is but a motion of limbs, the beginning of whereof is in some principal part within the body of the thing. Why, he says, may we not say that all automata that is, engines that move themselves by springs and wheels, as for example a watch does, 
have an artificial life. There's no real difference between a complicated mechanical automata, like a watch or maybe a robot, something like that, and a human being. We're just a complicated machine. Four, he says, what is the heart but a spring? And the nerves but so many strings. Okay, so he goes through the kind of analogy between various body parts and mechanical um, and mechanical processes. Mechanical elements. And further down, he says, uh, still on this first page, that a commonwealth, a political society, he says, is nothing but an artificial man, though of greater stature and strength than natural, than the natural human being, and is for whose protection and defense it was intended. So a commonwealth, a political society, is set up in order to help protect natural human beings. And it's nothing more than an artificial human being. And he says, sovereignty of the commonwealth is an artificial soul, which gives life and motion to the body. And he continues to give further analogies between the parts of a commonwealth and the physical, material parts of human being. Um, look down toward the bottom of the page, where he says, um, concord in a commonwealth is health, uh, sedition in a commonwealth, sickness, and civil war in a commonwealth is death. It stops functioning as a live being. Um, Lastly, he says, from page 3 to 4 there, the pacts and covenants by which the parts of this body politic were at first made, set together and united, resemble that fiat or the let us make man pronounced by God in creation. So the agreement, the contract, the pact, sets up a commonwealth, and that's what creates it. Okay. Um, so the point of Leviathan, the point of this, um, the idea is to think of the commonwealth as an artificial man, an artificial thing. And the point of this book is to describe this artificial person, to describe this political society. So the title, Leviathan, is an allusion to um, the biblical sea monster. Um, Exactly what Hobbes intended here is somewhat of a matter of controversy um, because in the Bible, the Leviathan is sometimes associated with the idea of the devil. Um, but Hobbes is apparently is not thinking of it that way. He seems to have chosen this simply because of its awesome power. And that's what he wants this artificial man in this commonwealth to have. Okay, so very quickly, we get different parts, parts one through four. The first part is of man. He says this is describing the matter thereof and the artifice of man. So this is describing natural human beings. So the commonwealth, the artificial man, is made out of, is made from natural human beings, the matter thereof. And it's also created by natural human beings. So this is what Hans is going to be describing in part one. Part two, then, is called of the Commonwealth. And this is, obviously, describing how the Commonwealth is put together, how it's constructed, and its various parts. Part three is called um, of, uh, uh, of a Christian Commonwealth. And this is describing the proper role of religion in the commonwealth. 
Um, and then finally, part four of the kingdom of darkness. This is how specifically the Catholic Church undermines the Commonwealth. How it divides loyalty away from um, the Commonwealth um, and creates sedition and war. But there are other um, villains in this chapter, in particular uh, people who use scripture, who use the Bible, to confuse people about their allegiance to the commonwealth, to the sovereign. Um, this is the problem with the Catholic Church, after all, which, for Hobbes, divides loyalty away from the sovereign, away from the commonwealth. Okay, so um, in part one, we're going to get the metaphysical and scientific picture of man, of human beings. Um, and this picture is going to be, of course, strongly materialistic. It's going to, in fact, be mechanistic. And it's going to be deterministic. So Hobbes is committed to explaining everything about human beings, our behavior, our psychology, our beliefs, our desires, our actions. Hobbes is committed to ex giving a full explanation of human beings in deterministic, mechanical terms. And this is what he sets out to do in the first um, few chapters. So you can see right here the very important influence of the new natural sciences. Hobbes wants to use these methods this approach to um, extend from physics, from the natural world, to the human world. He wants a human science, or maybe even a social science, based on the model of these natural sciences. Okay, so chapters one through four, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, Chapter one is called Of Sense, and Hobbes is just arguing here that our thoughts are representations of the appearance of objects. So the origin of all of our thoughts, the origin of all of our mental contents is through sense. This is what he says, just in the second paragraph there. He says the origin of them all is that which we call sense, for their sensation. For there is no conception in a man's mind which hath not at first, totally or by parts, been begotten upon the organs of sense. So everything in our minds, every thought that we have, has its origin in our sensation of the world. So sense is what human bodies produce when we bump into stuff, when stuff interacts with us, when material objects press against our bodies, we are constructed so as to produce sensations. That's what sense is. Okay, going on to chapter two. Imagination, then, is what he calls decaying sense. So we bump into something, or something bumps into us. We have a sensation of it. And when the causing object is removed, there's kind of a trace of it that remains in our bodies, in our nervous systems. And gradually, this trace diminishes over time so that we remember something, and memory is just, a, as it were, a less vivid sensation of the thing. Okay, but he's talking here about imagination, not memory. And it seems like maybe he's confusing the two of these, memory and imagination. Um, that's right. Um, but he would say he's not confusing them. They really are just the same thing. That our memory of something 
is really no different than our imagination of it. Because there's nothing in our minds, for example,